Excellent. Good. Started. Really good to be here. Uh, you may be surprised to see one of me and not two. And I should explain why it's just me doing this and uh, not Judy and me together. It's because there's some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that uh, Judy fell over on her way to a new inspiration recording and she broke her arm really rather badly. Um, the good news is that this was a little while ago and she's had surgery and she's recovering very, very well. But uh, she can't be here today and she asked me to send you all her very, very best wishes. So you've got just me uh, and what I'd like to do is show you some of the features of new inspiration. We hope that we've kept the best of the original version but we've listened to lots and lots of feedback from users around the world and we've done some fresh thinking ourselves. So while we hope that we haven't, as it were, thrown out the baby with the bathwater, um, there will be lots of things for me to show you now. What I'm going to do is start with a, an overview of all four levels and then move on to look at specific features. Now, in any new course, what you'd expect are lots of new texts and pictures. And at levels one and two, we've got new photo stories. This one is from level one. You can see we've moved the story to a new location. Can any of you see or guess where it is? If so, try typing it in for me, please. It may help if uh, you're at the IATFL conference in Brighton uh, this year. That's right, Brighton, Brighton coming up. Uh, it's set in Brighton at level one. And in level two, still in London, and a very famous landmark in the background. Um, try typing in the landmark. Very good coming up already, yes, it's the London Eye. Now, to go with these new photo stories, we've got lots of new topics at level one and two. And this is taken from uh, a lesson on describing people from book one. And as you can see, there are five texts and five pictures. And what these students do is match text and picture. I'm going to read you one of the texts. If you can match the text with the country of the person described, you'll see there are five flags down the left-hand side. So let's have a go, and when you guess the country, type it in. She has pink hair and big sunglasses. Her t-shirt is black. Her trousers are red check, and she has a shoulder bag. Her country's flag is red and white. <laughs> yes, very easy. Japan, that's right. Lots of people got that. Excellent. And then moving on, here's another topic from level one. It's from a lesson on making comparisons called climate change, better or worse. And I wanted to show it to you to, so that you can see that even at the lowest level, you can do serious cross-curricular work. And one more from level one. This is uh, towards the end of level one, and it's a, a newspaper text which we've simplified, headed, where does all the money go? And interviews here with two teenagers. And I'm sure you can guess that it's a lesson about describing money and possessions. And just as the previous one showed cross-curricular possibilities, this one shows cross-cultural possibilities. Our students can compare the situation in their own country 
with the situation in Britain from this text. Now, moving on into book two, this is a 14-year-old German boy, it's another newspaper article, who walking to school one day was hit by a meteorite. And the lesson is of describing what was happening and you can imagine what he was doing when the meteorite hit him. And if you look closely at your screens, you can see the meteorite about the size of a pea uh, in his enlarged hand there. The next one, I'm not even going to ask you to tell me who this is. Very familiar, I'm sure, to all of you. Daniel Radcliffe, who played Harry Potter. Uh, it's a lesson on future plans and there's an article about what Dan Radcliffe is going to do after he's finished the Harry Potter series and this goes on to personalised activities where students talk about their future holiday plans. I mentioned cross-curricular level one and now I want to show you two lessons from level two, two, new, two more new lessons where we look at science and English. This is the first one, it's entitled Satnavs, how do they do it? And tells the story of satellite navigation systems. Uh, so that students are learning both science and English at the same time. Here's another one from level two. This, this lesson is about maglev trains. Magnetic levitation is what maglev stands for. And it's about trains that have no wheels, no brakes, no engine, but travel at 500 kilometers an hour. And there's a picture at the top there of one which is in service in Shanghai in China. So again, students are learning science, they're learning technology and English at the same time. Finally, from level two, I have one about a lesson focusing on describing a process. Now here's a question for you. Do you recognize the puppets in the picture? Can you type in the name of the picture if, if you recognize it. The idea here is that describing a picture, describing a process can be quite dull, but by focusing on a very popular animated film, we lift the interest level. And yes, I'm getting in some answers already and uh, Agnieszka is here first. Fantastic Mr. Fox and the text describes how the film was made. Moving into level three, you'd expect in level three longer texts and these providing a more sustained possibility for cross-curricular work. And I want to start with a piece of social history. This is a, a skills lesson uh, from book three and it tells the story of the start of the American Civil Rights Movement in 1958 when a black woman, Rosa Parks, got on a bus in Alabama and sat in the seats reserved for white people when the driver refused to let her off the bus, to, to refuse, when the driver asked her to move, she refused and the subsequent bus strikes led Martin Luther King to lead the American Civil Rights Movement. So here again you can see we're dealing with social history as well as practicing language skills. At the end of the same unit we have a culture, a new culture lesson called Women in the World and it deals with the position of women, in which countries women have the vote, when they got the vote and 
what the share of government is in different countries. And it starts with a quiz which I, I'd like to do with you. I'll read out each statement and pause for you to type in T if you think it's true or F if you think it's false. Ready? Off we go then. First statement, women do 66% of the world's work. True or false? False, true, 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 true. More truths coming through. Yes, it is true. Statement two, women produce 50% of the world's food. True or false? False, 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 true, 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 false. Mixture there, I think you're about 50-50. In fact, it's true. Third statement, women earn 10% only of the world's income. True or false? Lots of falses there. And now some truths coming through. <laughs> Andre says it sounds horrifying. It is horrifying and it's absolutely true. The next one, if it is true, is even more horrifying. Women own 1% of the property in the world. True or false? Some false, more true is coming. Again about 50-50. And again the horrifying fact is that it's true. Two more statements. Women make up 70% of the world's poorest people. True or false? I think you're getting the idea of it now. Nearly all truths coming through there. And last but not least, women make up 64% of the people in the world who are illiterate. Yes, true again. So, in fact, all six of those statements, which one of you called horrifying, are in fact true. And again, this is a way for our students to, even at quite a low level, find out about the world and discuss real issues. Moving on, this is still book three. Here's a lesson which may be familiar to those of you who know the original inspiration. It's describing a picture which we've, in which we've changed the pictures. There's no prizes for guessing uh, who painted the bottom left picture. Uh, do you know who the other two artists are? Um, no need to type the answer in, but you probably recognize uh, this one here is by Renoir, and the bottom one by Roy Lichtenstein. So that's people whose visual intelligence is favored. And now I'd like to move on to another cross-curricular lesson called We Are Not Alone. This is a, a lesson about logical deduction and expressing possibility and raises the possibility that there are in fact millions of other planets like Earth but not in our solar system beyond it. And at the bottom of the page down here you can see facts about our solar system and then on the right hand side of the page students make deductions and discuss possibility in trying to match the images here with the words in the box. So again, a strong cross-curricular line. And here moving from outer space to inner space, um, here's a lesson about personal development uh, called Memory Power, stuffed full of tips for students to learn how to improve their memories. Uh, useful personal development and obviously something that will come in handy in the exams. Now it's not all intellectual work here. Here's a figure I'm sure you'll recognize even if his name 
didn't figure very largely. It's the world 100 and 200 meters record holder, Usain Bolt. And we have extracts from his autobiography, very relevant in the forthcoming Olympic year. And he has very interesting views on charity, on training, but also, for example, on drugs. And his message on drugs, not surprisingly, is stay away. And he reveals that he is tested every time he runs. And every day has to give authorities details of his whereabouts in case they want to make a random test. That was the last one from book three. Let's have a quick look at book four. Here's uh, a new culture lesson. And it's based on the European Young Scientist of the Year competition and gives winners, recent winners, from Denmark, from Spain, from Russia, from Turkey, and Switzerland. And I'd like briefly just to focus on the one from Russia down here. It's a wonderful teenager called Olga Gavrina, who invented a way of detecting cataracts. You know how the eyes of older people can get blocked by cataracts. Well, normally the only test is in a hospital. But Olga developed a way using digital cameras to do a test for cataracts at home. You know when you take a photograph which may be too close like this <laughs> with a digital camera, you get red eye in the eyes. And um, Olga devised a way in which this red eye effect can be used as a, a test for cataracts and is 95% accurate. Now, that was our whistle stop through four levels. Let's go back now to uh, look at particular issues as we go through new inspiration. I've shown you lots of lessons, and you may well be asking yourself, how do they deal with language? Philip's been giving us functional lesson headings, but what about the grammar? What about the language? Where's it gone? <laughs> Let me show you. Here's a lesson, another new lesson. It's based on the uh, world, world famous Glastonbury Pop Festival. And as you can see from the, well, maybe you can't read on your screens, but the top left, the uh, lesson head, gives the functional aim of talking about likes and dislikes. And underneath the language aim, which is verb, preposition, plus gerund. And students read the text, move through some comprehension activities and pronunciation. They do a listening, which focuses on the target language and the speaking activity. I love doing this. I'm bad at doing that. And then in a box called language workout, always in the bottom right-hand corner of each of the first three lessons of each unit, we have examples of the target structure for students to complete and a reference to the language file at the back of the book. And in New Inspiration, we have a, an enlarged language file which contains not just full paradigms and um, rules and exercise. It also has practice exercises. So an enlarged language file at the back of the book. And this positioning of the language here at the end of the lesson doesn't mean that we intend teachers and students necessarily only to do it at the end. That and the language file at the back of the book offer flexibility because they're there for the teacher to do at any time or the students refer to at any time during the lesson. So much for grammar. Now you may say, what about vocabulary? Here's a, a revised lesson on what the stars like doing in their free time. 
and you'll find in New Inspiration a much greater emphasis on vocabulary. At the start of this lesson, there is a, a word bank full of different, a lexical set with different uh, leisure activities in it. And the students are, <coughs> excuse me, oh, very dry here. Macmillan Oxford air conditioning is working well. Uh, the, the students match the photographs of the stars, leisure activities, with the ones in the word bank. Now this double page spread also shows two extension activities, one after the pronunciation here and one after the listening there. Now those of you familiar with the course will know that in the teacher's book we've always had lots of extra optional activities. What we've done is build new activities into the lessons called extension so that they fulfill two aims. Firstly, they are extra activities which teachers can give students who are what we call fast finishers, students who complete something before the rest of the class, or for classes where there are mixed ability, it will offer a more challenging activity for the uh, better gifted students, and also for classes where there are more hours than normal, it offers extra activities. Those of you, again, familiar with the original course will know that at levels three and four, we had a big focus on learning styles in the Inspiration Extra lessons and a Your Choice section with four different activities for students to choose from, each reflecting a learning style. Now, in New Inspiration, we've extended this to levels one and two, where the Inspiration Extra lessons contain two activities of differing kinds for students to choose from, although there isn't um, a, a particular learning styles focus in it. Another aspect of the original course, of course, was personalization. And we've carried this through into new inspiration as well. Now, you remember this lesson we had a look at earlier. It's about Daniel Radcliffe, and the text reveals various aspects of his personal life which aren't really public knowledge. And after the text, as in all the first three lessons of every unit throughout the whole course, there's a new activity called Your Response, which gets a, a personal reaction to the content of the lesson. And I'd like to do this one with you. Um, the your response for the Daniel Radcliffe lesson is, why do you think some students bullied Radcliffe at school? Question one. And two, what causes bullying? So, why do you think some students bullied Daniel Radcliffe? And what causes bullying? Now, you see there's two different types of questions there. One, to make a deduction from the text, because the text doesn't, um, doesn't tell us exactly why. We have to think. And I've got suggestions coming. He wears glasses. He was too shy. He was too polite. He liked books. Now, jealousy. We've got two jealousies coming up. And it's true that he said in a recent interview that students were jealous of him being such a huge star. The text also offers other possible reasons for him being bullied, one of which is that he suffers from something called 
dyspraxia. Now, I've never heard of this either. It's quite rare. But it means that, for example, his coordination isn't very good. So, for example, he can't ride a bicycle, he can't swim, he can't tie up his shoelaces. Um, so, again, this is a strong personalization thing which moves from a media personality into discussion of the causes of bullying. Another new feature in New Inspiration is this. Can you see at the top it's called Preview? Now at the end of every two units we still have our review. This new one at the beginning of each two units looks forward to what the students can expect. Can you see on the left hand page it begins with listings of communicative aims and topics and vocabulary and then across the spread there are six pictures with extracts from six lessons. And the first activity is for the students to match the six of the topics with these six pictures. The next one, and we'll come back to this, is a Wordle where students match three different lexical sets with the names of the sets. Then there's a listening activity where students hear three lesson extracts and match them with topics. And finally, in each preview, there is a quiz or a questionnaire. And I'd like to have a go at doing this one with you. Here we are. This is a bit bigger. Whoops, I've gone too far. I'll go back. There. There's the quiz. It's an animal facts quiz. True or false? We'll do it the same as last time with you typing T or F. One, a hippo can open its mouth one meter wide. True or false? True, true, true. False, false, false. True, true, true. About 50-50. It's true. Question two. Dolphins can sleep with one eye open. True or false? Good. Most of you are saying true. Some false is there. Again, it's true. Now, this the next one's a funny one. Owls are the only birds which can see the color blue. Is it true or false? Lots of falses, but my friends, it's true again. Number four, penguins are the only birds which can swim but not fly. Is that an easier one? Yeah, we're getting true all the way through there. Number five, dogs can hear sounds that people can't. Again, true. And last, and in fact that is the last one, on the right hand side here, there is always a believe it or not. A an interesting little fact here, like people and dolphins, elephants can recognize themselves in a mirror. And again, all of the statements in this true-false quiz were true, but I promise you that elsewhere in New Inspiration, that's not the case. Now let's go to the Wordle which we looked at. Here it is. And you can see the aim is for you to try and put the words in the Wordle on the right-hand side into the three lexical sets on the left hand side. Nothing I want you to type in now, but just have a look at it and see if you can do it. All of this is vocabulary the students know which is coming in the next two units. So it's a vocabulary revision and preparation. If you've had a look at it, that's right, whales are animals. And there are the answers. So, very straightforward. 
Now, learner independence was a, a big theme in the original inspiration, and it is in new inspiration. Every skills lesson has a whole column of learner independence activities, and the review at the end of every two units has a self-assessment exercise which picks up on the communicative aims which we saw at the beginning in the preview, ask students to feel, to say how they feel about them, and refers them to workbook exercises, which you can see down here after each one, if they feel they need to do more work. Um, another new feature of New Inspiration in the Inspiration Extra lessons, every other Inspiration Extra, there is a new activity called Language Links. And there are four of these at each level, and they adopt what the Council of Europe have termed a plurilingual, plurilingual approach. Now, that's a, that was a new word for me when we started on all of this. So let's have a, a quote from the Council of Europe document which says what it is. A plurilingual approach emphasizes the fact that as an individual's person of language in its cultural context expands from the language of the home to that of society at large and then to the languages of other peoples, he or she does not keep these languages and cultures in strictly separated mental compartments, but rather builds up a communicative competence in which all knowledge and experience of language contributes, and in which languages interrelate and interact. In other words, when, for example, learners come across unknown words in a new language, they use not only the resources of the mother tongue to try and work out what the word means, but also the resources they've gained by exposure to other languages. Now, that's lots of long words and sounds very theoretical, but I hope you'll agree that the way we've exploited it is both practical and fun. I want to give you some examples. Here's the first one. Now, it's a lesson language links from book one, and you can see there are four languages there, and four sets of signs. And the student's task is very simple to match the signs that mean the same things in each language, and then to say if there are any similarities between the meanings of the words in the different languages. So, in a sense, it's raising language awareness across languages. And while, while we're on the topic of signs, I, I can't resist showing you a wonderful sign that uh, Judy dug up, and I know she'd like you to see. I don't know, are there any Welsh speakers in the group? Anyone speak Welsh? If you do, type it in and say so. Well, here's a, a bilingual sign from Wales, and you can see the text in English at the top and the text in Welsh underneath. The only problem is that the text in Welsh doesn't mean what the text in English means. Let me show you the translation. <laughs> What happened was someone uh, emailed the request for a translation to the in-house translator of the local council, and he got his, his computer sent back an automatic message. I'm not in the office at the moment. Please send any work to be translated. And this is what was put up on the sign. Unfortunately, the sign is no longer there as... Uh, some Welsh speakers immediately saw it, and the council had to change it. But I thought, I thought you might enjoy that one. 
Here's another, another language links. Here we've got congratulations in nine different languages and uh, a matching exercise between the words and the languages. And then an extension into, you can say please and thank you in your language. What about other languages? So more plurilingualism. Here's a final example. This is from packeting at quite a low level. And students are asked again to find similarities between the languages. At a higher level, you can obviously do similar work, and we do do similar work, with multilingual menus and with asking people to look at the form of the language. Questions like, which language uses the most capital letters, for example. Now, uh, we're coming near the end of this webinar, but I'd like to show you some of, very briefly, some of the other components. The new inspiration workbooks contain lots of new texts, lots of new pictures. Each lesson contains more extension activities, but also new at the back, there are four CLIL lessons. This is a CLIL geography lesson from level, let me see, level two, uh, and it's on tropical rainforests. So we cover geography, science, maths, music, lots of different themes providing more CLIL input. And then in the teacher's book, at the back, we've got lots and lots of photocopyable activities, one for each lesson. Here's a, a clothes bingo one. And um, these can be photocopied uh, and used for uh, class activities. Those of you who knew the old original inspiration resource packs uh, will be familiar with the concept. Now you may say, come on, Philip, where are the songs? You haven't mentioned any songs. And it's true, the, there are no songs in the student's book. However, the good news is that the text of all the songs is in the teacher's book, and all the songs are still there. They're recorded on the CDs that come with the course. So although they're not on the page, they are still very much with us. Now, you would expect from Macmillan lots of digital resources, and there's a tremendous offering for new inspiration. First of all, on the fabulous Macmillan Practice Online set, uh, site, there is uh, macmillanpracticeonline.com slash new inspiration with loads and loads of more practice activities. There is the interactive classroom for those of you with interactive whiteboards. And also on the teacher's website, we've got loads and loads more activities and resources for you. So that was a brief look at new inspiration. And 45 minutes are up. Uh, I'm here to answer any of your questions you have or to participate in a discussion. So that's it from me. It's now very much over to you. No, no need to thank me. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, five minutes before we started, um, the laptop fell asleep. <laughs> so um, Caroline and I were both here and we didn't think it would work at all. Um, and then suddenly you all came online and the technology worked. And I can see now Caroline's asking if there are any questions. Um, very happy to answer them if they come in. And Dave, thank you very much. And of course I will pass on your, your greetings to Judy. Um, 
<laughs> yes, Andre, you're quite right. The technology almost failed us. There was another terrible moment, uh, which I'm sure Caroline won't mind me sharing with you. 20 minutes before we started, the laptop suddenly showed um, battery low warning light. Um, but that was my fault because I'd forgotten to switch the power on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Agatha. I'm glad you're going back to work. Enjoy it. Um, yes, I know these technological things happen, but I was just very glad, Lord, that uh, we all got together in the end. It's the first webinar I've done. Boris uh, um, is asking, Philip, did you write the text yourselves? Or did your publisher have a say in the selection of the texts? Now, we wrote and adapted uh, all of the texts ourselves. But they are, at the lower levels, entirely written by us. And then as you go up the levels, simplified, authentic texts. So we had a very free hand. But the topics which we chose were very much influenced by research we did before starting on New Inspiration which involved meeting groups of teachers in different markets, observing classes, spending time with students using original inspiration, and asking them, what would you like to see new? What would you like to see different? So we feel this is very much a collaboration between us and you. And I know I'm not meant to wave my hands around, but it's, it's a collaboration between us and you and your students in this sense. The teachers from what countries have been asked? Well, we had feedback from all of the major markets of inspiration. We obviously couldn't visit all of them ourselves. So we had feedback from countries all the way from uh, Russia through Argentina. There are different versions of inspiration used in South America, in Brazil and Mexico, all across Europe. We spent time particularly in Switzerland. Poland has had a, a big input in it, into it. I know that Poland has its own special edition of New Inspiration, but the work they did there was very helpful to us, as was uh, input from Spain, very big market, lots of teacher input there, and of course Turkey as well. So it would be invidious to pick out every country, but we are so grateful to all of you for what we received. And Caroline's coming and she's writing something down. I think she's going to say, say whatever, whatever I think she's telling me to shut up. <laughs> Would I? <laughs> and Northern Cyprus as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is really, really very multicultural. And I think the fact that uh, inspiration, um, as you point out, is widely used is because it's very flexible. Different people do different things with it with different groups. And uh, that's something which uh, we're very proud of. Now, I think uh, Caroline's looking at me very sternly now. So I'll have to stop, but I must confess I don't know how to. I will come in fast. Can you uh, do the technology? <laughs> Goodbye, and thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.